Hello, Stitchers. Welcome to Stitch Please, the official podcast of Black Women's Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. I'm your host, Lisa Woolfork. I'm a fourth generation sewing enthusiast with more than 20 years of sewing experience. I am looking forward to today's conversation. So sit back, relax, and get ready to get your stitch together. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Stitch Please podcast. You are listening to the very first new way of recording the podcast. I am trying this new method to see how it goes, but there are great benefits for this method if you are a Patreon supporter because I'll be able to share things like photos and this person that we're talking to today, y'all, you are going to want to see the photos because I am talking with Miss Letitia Porter, also known as the head executive goddess in charge of Nicole Elise Designs, LLC, that houses Nicole Elise Fabrics as well as Nicole Elise Custom Sewing. Letitia Porter is setting Instagram on fire with her amazing reels that are funny and classic and beautiful. And they show such a beautiful sense of her style, which is so unique and just active is what I think. I just think the colors are bold and active and fun and bright. And I am so glad to have you here with us today. Thank you so much for being here, Letitia. Oh, hi. Thank you, Lisa. You're about to make me cry. (laughs) I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. It is a pleasure just talking to you. I'm so grateful. So we're going to begin at the beginning. Letitia, can you tell us your sewing story? How did you get started? How did sewing come into your life? I am a third generation seamstress and my grandmother had six girls. My mother was one of six. She was the second oldest. My grandmother was a seamstress. She taught all of her girls how to sew. My mother and my oldest, they took it up professionally. Growing up, I really didn't have an interest in sewing. My mom used to make me cut out the pieces. That's about all she let me do. And I think I did something in home economics, probably like the seventh or eighth grade. Mm -hmm. My grandmother passed away in 2012. Our lives changed because our matriarch was born. Yeah. Us being grandchildren, I don't feel like I was able to properly breathe because I was holding up my mother and my aunt. Yes. Um, yes. Fast forward to 2015, I was missing my grandma. And out of nowhere, literally, I, one day I just said, I want to sew. And I had mentioned it to my mother and my mother was like, yeah, right. You run the streets too much. You always want to go. Like, basically, I'm not disciplined enough. It just was really strong. I wanted to connect with her. I put it out on Facebook that I wanted a sewing machine. A friend of mine got me a sewing machine from New Jersey, brand new, in the box, and the rest of is three. Wow. So your sewing story has two beginnings. Yes. One is in 2015 when you made this proclamation, I want to sew. And then you had friends and folks in the community that were like, okay, we can help with that. Here's that. But before 2015 and your decision to choose sewing, Sewing had chose you had chose. way before you were even here. That's right. You know, with your great grandma and your grandma and your mom. And then you, it was here waiting for you. That's right. And so like when you finally started to pick it up and there's really nothing, at least for me, I don't usually consider myself a really, really super bad patty. Mm-hmm. But all it takes is somebody to tell me not to do something. Right. Or... You can't do that. You can't focus. You too busy. You won't be. Oh, oh, really? (laughs) Uh, Can I not? Really? I can't have a podcast, you say? Right. Let's see about that, shall we? (laughs) You know, and so like, how did it turn out? Well, obviously it turned out great. Was your mother surprised that you were able to stick with it? Or was she just happy that you finally saw the light? She was. For a long time, my grandmother would call me a grasshopper. She would say, oh, you're coming along, grasshopper. You're coming along, grasshopper. And I think maybe like a year and a half to two years in, she finally gave me my wings and called me a butterfly. Oh, that's right. That's but, right. You have learned. Right. I had learned. But here's another beginning before I even got into my fabric selling. I had started buying fabric before I even started sewing. Like I made the proclamation in 2015, but I didn't start sewing until I think 2016. But I had a bunch of fabric. My eye just 
was going crazy when I went in the fabric stores. Like I was in the candy store and I was just buying up fabric. But tell me, when did the fabric buying happen? Is this prior to 2015 or was it just in the interim between 2015 and 16? In the interim, when I made, after I had declared that that's what I wanted to do. I oh, you're right. Store. You need fabric to sew. Like, what's <laughs> the point of declaring it? It's not like you were buying fabric and telling everybody, I hate sewing and let me go get these eight yards of fabric for no reason. Exactly. And my mother was an amazing, she is an amazing seamstress. She only sews for herself at this point. She does alterations. But she had me in the fabric store when I was younger. So in yep. the fabric store is where I still go, not so much fusion all the time. But for like personal projects, yes, the staple in the community and in our family. Isn't that beautiful? This kind of generational yes. thing. And also how fortunate that there's a brick and mortar store that's been around that long that you can go to. It's 50 years. Yes. Wow. That is incredible. And so you made a proclamation in 2015. You said, I would like to sew. And you started collecting fabrics. And then a sewing machine came to you. How did you balance? And so I'm thinking right now, here we are in 2022. And this is, uh, I guess, you know, mathing. It's like seven years or so after you've made the declaration. And you have a fabric business and a custom sewing business all under the heading of Nicole Elise LLC. And that's the Instagram account, Nicole Elise, y'all, that is like hot fire. There's reels, there's stories, there's (laughs) posts. It's all bangers all the time. It's really wonderful. So how on earth does someone who just decides to say in 2015, I want to sew, go from a reluctant apprentice who was, as a child, you got to cut the patterns, which is not the funnest part of sewing because you're not really sewing. They made you do the grunt work. I bet they let you pick up the pins off the floor too, I bet. Over here and bring them young eyes over here. Before they had needle threading machines, they had children with small hands and we were the needle thread. So like, how did you get from there to where you are now, which is two sewing businesses? I think it was just drive and passion. I felt something that I was passionate about about outside of what I do professionally and seemed like I was overexerting myself ever because I love to do it. In the fabric store, it was just like me going literally in a candy shop. I'm not a candy person. I don't have any cavities. (laughs) All right. But the feeling that I get when I go into the fabric store was just overwhelming. So it just made me want to make things. In addition to that, on the flip side, I am a single mother of two. And so Mm. I open my clothes so that I can spend less money on me. So I thought and more rights. My daughter. (laughs) Yes. yes. I love that sewing myth that you got going on there. Like I will save in 2015, you still had that 1973 attitude that saving money is something you can accomplish with sewing. And in fact, ha ha, psych. (laughs) So that didn't exactly turn out that same way. How did it turn out instead? <laughs> it did not. It ended with me with loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of fabric. <laughs> but I'm okay. I'm okay with that, obviously, because <laughs> I turned it into a store. And what happened was people started asking me. I was more or less more active, like on Facebook in the McCall's pattern group. I was more active on there until I learned about IG. And I had no idea about the sewing community on Instagram. Someone had inboxed me. They asked me if I sold the fabric mm. from the dresses that I wore because they lived in rural areas and they didn't have stores or shops that other than, let's say, a Joann's where they could find other varieties of fabric. Really what kind of sparked or I would say that was the catalyst to the business. I had the interest, but it was just the interest. But that propelled me. That's really wonderful because in some ways I feel like not only are you a role model, you are also a very powerful enabler. Because now I think that maybe I too could have a fabric store in my studio. Sure, I could, except that I don't want to sell anybody my fabric, Letitia. (laughs) I want to keep all the stuff that's here is for me. And I couldn't have a store because that would mean I would have to release some of this fabric that I have voluntarily. (laughs) <laughs> or you can do the, do some work, do some homework, do some research, get yourself a good distributor. You have a great fan base and following. I have no doubt that you could. I have no doubt that you could. 
I really appreciate the faith you have in my abilities. And we are going to leave the conversation there because I am of the opinion that I cannot take on not another damn one thing. Not none. Not a thing. I'm just like, mm, there's a lot of great ideas in the world. And I am glad that there are other people to do them, especially when they do them as good as you. Here you are. You are about that Philly sewing life. And I want to hear about it. Not only you live in Philadelphia, so you obviously sew in Philadelphia. And Philadelphia has a lot of really great sewing stuff, actually. I met with Michelle Norris and her magazine, the Sewn Magazine that's in Philadelphia. There, it's Sarah Bond, and she's a well-known, like, world-renowned quilter, and she's in Philadelphia. And you run Philly Sewing Style. You've got to tell me about that. What is it about Philly that's unique for sewing. You know, all the regions have their own things. L.A. has its own sewing scene, the New York sewing scene. What is the Philly sewing scene like? I think the Philly sewing scene is unscripted, if you will. It's very organic. Everybody, no one's scared to be themselves and present what they like for themselves. No one sews alike, but everyone is bold in what they do. And I think that's the major thing with us even down from Fabric Row, down 4th and South on Dale. Michael Daddy Dressed Me by M. Yes, yes. He owned, him and Ava owned their style. And I think that's wonderful. We just buy, make, and wear what we like. I think that's the Philly thing. I love that. Sometimes too, I think we go against the grain. Say more about that. What do you mean you go against the grain? Give me an example. For me, going against the grain, I try not to conform to what everyone else does. If I like a pattern, I'm going to make that pattern about 50,000 times. I'm not a one and done. I don't agree with that. I agree with make whatever you want, however many times you want. I have a pattern right now. I have worn that pattern out. I mean, over 50 dresses for myself. I'm not ashamed of it. If you grew up in Philly, Mm -hmm. have a no nonsense type attitude. All right now. All right now. And not too much affects you like that (laughs) because you got to. (laughs) Yes. Because you got to be strong. That's right. I love that because one of the things about making 50 dresses in the same style, the difference between you doing that and, you know, maybe some fast fashion house doing that is that every single one of yours is different. Yes. And every single one of yours, you could probably wear that same dress pattern every single day to work and people would not realize that you were wearing the same pattern because that is what creativity is. That's what it means to put your own flavor on it. And that's what you do so often, so beautifully. And you see it just like a radiant light. And when you see that on Instagram, you know, you got your strut, you know, she's looking, she's like, I know y'all looking. I know, I know. Now tell me a bit more about what was it like to be in Sewn Magazine? And I'm not sure if you spend a lot of time with the magazine editors because I know y'all are both in the same city, but what is that like? Have you been in the magazine more than one time? No, I've only been in there once. But once is great. I was in there once. I was very proud of myself. I showed everybody. Yeah, I did too. I couldn't believe it. Like when I received the email, like, ah! kind of like when I received your inbox. It was like, oh. I got like serious. Like, uh-huh. It was major to me. And as I was filling out your questionnaire, I'm like, she doesn't even know that Black Women Stitch or the Stitch podcast. This is major right here. So it was a learning experience. Yeah. I had anyone like judge my garment before. So I initially started out with one dress. It had to switch to another. I had to have a little bit of thick skin because probably half of them thought that I was going to just throw in a towel. And a couple of soul sisters talked me off the ledge. The day I did the photo shoot of the first dress, they had to ditch. It was 94 degrees outside. Oh, my gosh. So hot. Sweat was pouring off my Wow. Head. But then the second one, which was what I was going to do initially, it just all fell together so nicely in in my studio. It was just really nice to see myself from the beginning to the end of the project and then to see it published. Telling everybody, I mean, I need to be, look, I need to get me. (laughs) Exactly, because it is a process. You know, people don't realize all the energy that goes into a photo, Mm -hmm. especially one for a magazine that's going to be like in print. And you can't delete it or change it once it's in print. It's done. 
you know? And so there is a lot that goes into it. So I'm really glad to hear that. It's kind of like that Philly spirit shown through and you were like, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up and I'm not giving up on myself. And so at the end, you came through on the other side and ended up getting this. This is amazing. It felt good. This is really amazing. Hey, friends, hey. Stop on by the Black Women's Stitch Patreon page and help us gain 200 new subscribers by the end of 2022. The Black Women's Stitch Patreon page has been recalibrated to reflect three levels of giving with excellent benefits in each tier. Beginning at $5 a month, the Black Women's Stitch Patreon includes benefits such as videos of the Stitch Please podcast, monthly stitch ups, direct video messaging, a quarterly gift, and more. So check out the Black Women's Stitch Patreon and help us get 200 new subscribers by the end of 2022. The link to the Black Women's Stitch Patreon page is in the show notes. Help us help you get your stitch together. And thank you. I want to get back a little bit to the fabric business because I'm really interested in, it seems as though Nicole Elise, LLC, is a combination of two loves, two sides of your sewing life. Mm-hmm. It's the fabric side, which some might say is the supply side, right? Because you really can't have sewing without fabric. But right. then there's also there's the custom sewing side, which is like the output. Right. It seems like those things work really well together. When you think about these two halves of your business, how do the fabric business and the custom sewing feed into each other or do they? Or are they very, very firm and they don't cross paths? I would just imagine that when you're creating a custom look for someone, I just wondered if maybe because you have connections to distributors, you can find a unique fabric that other folks wouldn't have for your custom work. I'm not sure. How does that work? I think it's both. Both things kind of happen. A lot of times people will want something that they've seen me in. I mainly sew dresses and skirts for people. I sew pants for a little while, but I'm not interested. Too many fit issues. Most of my fabric comes from my distributor. So then I already have it available. So they do intertwine a lot. If they don't or if my customers are looking for something specific, I do have the advantage that I can reach out to my distributor and say, hey, I need X, Y and Z. And then they get it for me. Oh, great. That's really wonderful. And so custom sewing, I think it's such a challenging business. You know, I mean, when you said that you don't like to do pants because of all the fit issues and there are, you know, they change the crotch depth and the waistband and the gapping and the booty blessings. Like there's a lot of steps. Mm -hmm. But That's how I feel about custom sewing and alterations. That's just like, that's too much. No, uh uh-uh. But you do it. So tell me, how do you get past, I guess, maybe for some, the anxiety or the challenge of fitting another body well, one that's not yours, making things for other people so that it's to their custom taste. That just feels so hard. How do you manage? Okay. So I think because in what's almost seven years in, I've probably just this year come to the realization and knowledge like, no, I'm only going to do certain things. I'm not going to let people rush me because I've been there early on. So I had to learn some lessons. So the garments that I make for others, I can make them for myself with my eyes closed. So that gets me (laughs) with making it for them. And they're not always super complicated items because my slogan is fabric choice of everything. But if your fabric is fabulous, no one will really look at all the detail unless it's just a very, very detailed garment. That is awesome. I really love that slogan. Fabric choice is everything. And that's really powerful. I want you to talk about, do you have a good example of where a fabric choice made a difference? in what you were making that, you know, maybe when you saw it at one point, you had one opinion, but then when you switched the fabric, it gave you a different opinion? Yeah, actually, my birthday last year, I made a jumpsuit. I think you had the picture, but there's that one that I was. And I made a jumpsuit. It was a champagne colored pants jumpsuit off the shoulder. But then the skirt was made of this really pretty like brocade fabric. Wow. The skirt part was going to be the same As the jumper, and it that fabric and made it as the skirt, it just elevated the look. Wow. And I was super duper excited. I had so much fabric left. I still have a little bit of it left that I made a duster and I did like this. I called it the Josephina duster because every panel was a different color or a different. Oh my gosh. 
Oh man, that is amazing. That is amazing. Oh my, wow. The picture, it's really very stunning because this recording all is going to Patreon. We just shared this picture. Speaking of pictures, you've got to tell us about this. (laughs) Y'all, we are looking at a picture of what can only be described as a fashion runway victory garment. This is made out of caution tape. Talk about fabric choices, everything. And even when you don't have fabric, you can make some out of caution tape. Let us know how this beautiful idea come from. So that idea came from, I believe it was 2020, January 2020. There was a sewing bowl. It was called the Sewing Bowl Channel. Yes. It was by Tabitha Sower and Lynn. Okay. Well, her last name is escaping me at this time. But Lynn mm-hmm. wore rope soles. And you yes. had... Okay. Garment out of non traditional items. So, no, it couldn't wow. be any clothing, fabric, or anything. And I probably died almost two times making this dress. That's what? <laughs> the top part is an air filter. And I <gasps> spray painted the air filter. And oh my gosh. I was Googling ideas and I might have been on Pinterest and I saw like a dress is made out of newspaper. And I yep. said, okay, I want a ruffled dress. One of my girlfriends said, Tisha, why don't you try caution tape? And I'm like, caution tape? And I'd say, you know what? I'm going to use it. It's yellow and black. I went with it. I you know I wanted ruffles. I bought some muslin. Not a muslin person. I typically don't make muslins before I make garments. I probably should sometimes learn a lesson. I still never go back and do it. So I'm like, this was going to be fine without a muslin. This is going to be the time it will work just fine. Right, exactly. <laughs> I just started taping and sewing. Cutting it. Wow. It was a great experience. It looks like a great experience. It's really absolutely wonderful. It's such a beautiful and stunning piece, and it's so unusual. It really is. It's just so powerful. And I wanted you to talk a little bit about the way that you are taking over Instagram for the 9 9 and the 2000s <laughs> with all these amazing reels. And your 40,000 Instagram followers or something like that, give or take a few thousand. Honestly, this is really wonderful. Talk about this kind of boom in creativity in a whole nother venue. So I think what happened was anybody that knows me, my family and friends know I love to dance. I grew up in the church, but I love to dance. And this one video, I was followed Bishop Olds and his wife, and they mm-hmm video to a song of reels and I did this side by side reel throwing off this puffy sleeve top that I made. I had already worn it, but I literally was home. I think we were on a break like 20 minutes. I threw some tights on and threw this shirt on and learned to dance and I posted it. And that night, my following went from like 3,000, I think to like 7,000, but then it kept growing. And then a couple of weeks later, and I really wasn't thinking, I was just dancing. In these videos, I was learning the dances. And a couple weeks later, there was a reggae song on F. Tan Dress. And yes. Back to my college days at Delaware yeah. State University. And I started doing the dance. <laughs> I posted the video and that's what really went like crazy. I was like, oh my gosh, why are all these people following me? And then I was doing, kept doing some dancing like when I felt like doing it. But that's literally how it grew. That's how it grew. That is wonderful. And what has been some of the most surprising thing about now having such a large following? Has there been a change that you noticed between when you had 3,000 followers? I think the change is that I don't get to see the people that I know as much like I have to literally like go to their page. Obviously, there are some that still come up in my newsfeed, but we kind of grow apart as far as them coming on my newsfeed. They normally did. Other than that, not too much. Of course, the opinions of others or people, I feel like people asking sometimes inappropriate questions. That Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, but I take everything with a grain of salt anyway. And there's right. always ignore and block button. There is always the ignore and block <laughs> button. And on that note, we are going to ask you the question that we ask all our guests when we get ready to wrap up an episode. I will ask you, Miss Letitia Porter, the slogan of the Stitch Please podcast is that we will help you get your stitch together. What is your offering to us today? What is your advice based on your experience and your enormous success that you'd help us get our stitch together? I think that my advice would be there's no better time than now. If there's something you want to do, just do it. We have to turn the volume down on life and listen to ourselves and hear our hearts and follow our path. Once you start doing that, 
it just changes your whole perspective. Don't let anybody tell you what you can't do, what you won't do, or give a prescription of when you should do it. Go and do what's in your heart. You'll feel so much better. And on that note, thank you so much thank for this you. wonderful conversation. This has been wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you so much, Lisa. I really appreciate you. It's been a pleasure. You've been listening to Stitch, Please, the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. We appreciate you joining us this week and every week for stories that center Black women, girls, and femmes in sewing. We invite you to join the Black Women Stitch Patreon community with giving levels beginning at $5 a month. Your contributions help us bring the Stitch Please podcast to you every week. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your support and come back next week and we'll help you get your stitch together. Stitch, please.